Hello, welcome to Pod Bites. This will be episode 18. And um, in case uh, you're expecting to hear a different voice, um, I'm taking over hosting duties for Martin Watts, who's generally um, helming these. Um, I I think uh, he's off getting uh, attending his scheduled colonoscopy or something along those lines today. Um, but I'm here today uh, being joined by one of our uh, newest members on BNB Gaming, uh, Jeff Truen. How's it going, Jeff? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Uh, uh, doing fine myself. Thank you. I'm, uh, we, uh, are we getting you um, out of bed over there on the West Coast? Something like that. It's Saturday. But I'm oh, that's also true. <laughs> well, you know, all the more reason to sleep in. And uh, this is this will be a, a first, I believe, in a couple of ways. First of all, um, I don't believe we've ever had an all uh, North America pod bites, uh, or in this case, an all U.S. pod bites before. Uh, we've we've generally had all, um, or at least some of the the British folk um, getting their two cents in. So, all right, this maybe this is a sign of things to come. Who knows? possible uprising or something like that um and furthermore we've never to my knowledge have a have had a, a pod bites episode with um with only two of us so i think we we deserve a medal of some sort medal um, would be nice or <laughs> and an actual episode <laughs> yep and and if anybody's listening to this meaning that it went well um then i deserve you know i think maybe we should start talking about a raise or something like that hint hint martin if if he's listening to this at all, he, of course our own editor in chief may not be listening. So yeah, <laughs> and then uh, of course myself, um, Pascal Takaya, North American editor extraordinaire, or so I'm told. Um, so it's been a, uh, I don't know, I, I think uh, this this week's been um kind of slow news wise. Um, everybody pretty much preparing for the launch of um E3. For the, in the coming week, um, of course, there have been a few stories, but uh, how about um, how about us? Let's let's focus on the more important stuff and talk about um, not what's happening in the world of gaming, but what's happening in our world. Um, what have you been up to gaming-wise this week, Jeff? Um, I've mostly been playing a little PSP game called Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII, which is a prequel to the PlayStation game Final Fantasy VII, and it focuses on one of the smaller character, Zack, who only showed up for a little bit in the original game. It's just his backstory leading up to the events of the first one. And, now, and you had mentioned that you weren't um, 100% familiar with the actual Final Fantasy VII, correct? Right. I'm working on that. You'll find that I'm not familiar with most things. I pretend to be. With uh, Now, you mean like just in, in life or whatever? <laughs> uh, for gaming, just different things i'm just trying to get as much information as possible and that's kind of difficult to do at times i think actually it's um a pretty good thing to do it's just to kind of put that out there you know if you say right from the beginning um well we're not you yeah, know i have, really, I have from, no idea what i'm talking about so let's yeah go. And, and and specify that to gaming it'll, it'll really explain why we're doing a gaming podcast here yep. now but uh no but i mean uh, nothing like you know setting the bar low and then rising to the occasion right Something like that. Perhaps I should say the same thing about myself. Um, so Crisis Core is now. I'm I'm trying to just like really. Uh, I I have a feeling we're going to be talking a lot about uh, retro games today. Yeah. Um, and on on that note, let me just as an aside. Um, this is this is kind of interesting about Jeff for anybody who's um who hasn't checked out the team page recently. He's um so so Jeff, you've kind of come on board, and I think you've really just kind of carved out your name as being synonymous with like retro right away. Uh, we've talked about retro features and things like that a lot. And the yeah, interesting thing, huh? Go ahead. Oh yeah. Basically that's mostly what I'm trying to play the most of. That's more than modern games for some reason. Those just work with me better. Um, well, well, what do you, con what do you consider retro? I mean, maybe that could be a, a, a whole topic of conversation right there. Hmm. Well, other than Nintendo stuff, which, seeing as I'm the Nintendo correspondent, I sort of have to be up to date on, um, it's mostly just all the consoles other than this generation. 
Okay, so so your personal definition, you would say a retro um, would include like the PlayStation 2, the original Xbox. Yeah. Now, do you Those already? Things. Sorry. <laughs> uh, even with two of us, <laughs> apparently we cut each other off quite a bit. I wonder if you would consider um, the Nintendo DS retro at this point. I don't know if that's if the 3DS has been out enough for that to really be considered retro. I think some people go with a 10-year mark, that once the system has been out for 10 years, then you can consider it retro. Yeah, I've, I've kind of struggled with that myself a little bit. Like, um, you know, I, I'm I'm heading up a, a semi-retro feature on BNB as, as well, the video feature, Instant Replay, and um, every now and then I kind of... I, I have been focusing a lot on old, um, original NES games, um, but... I, I do kind of wonder, you know, how far up can I go in the timeline and still can be considered a, a retro game? But um, so yeah, the reason I pointed it out earlier is the interesting thing is I, I believe um, I'm pretty sure about this. You're the now the youngest member on BNB Gaming, and and not just in terms of having joined recently, but you're, I mean, just age-wise, I think uh, everybody else has got you know anywhere from months to years on you. Yeah, I literally turned. 18 last Friday, so. And I think the next one up will be probably Tom, and I think he's, uh, <laughs> I, I wish I knew for sure, but I think he's 19, yeah. <laughs> um, so if, I find it interesting that uh, you're immediately the retro guy, being as how you're the youngest one. Yeah, somehow that works. Yeah. Um, I think it's more that I just don't, I never really had access to the more modern consoles, so then I was was reading and listening to po- other podcasts about the older ones. So then once I actually got money to buy things, that's just immediately what I gravitated to. And what did you what's been your your personal journey? What did you start with? Um I I started with a, a DS just cuz I'm in Kirkland, which is near right next to Redmond where Nintendo Nintendo is. And that's just always what I've been interested in. And then oh, I went cheaper up there. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, I, I doubt it. I yeah. can't stop. <laughs> no. Um, and then I went, I got a 360 just for the family. That was just a present a couple of years back. But then once I actually went and started buying my own stuff, I went out and bought a Retron 3, which is one of the clone consoles that plays NES, Super Nintendo, and Genesis games all in one. Mm, is that a um, is it a top loading machine? Yeah, they're all three. It's three top loaders somehow crammed into one thing. Mm. You can plug a power glove into it if you want. Don't know why you want to do that. Um, I, I I couldn't say I've never used a power glove, and probably most people haven't. I I I'm not gonna lie. I want one, but I'm not gonna go out and spend money on it. If anyone out there wants to give me one, I will review it for you. Let's just put that out there now. It, um, review? <laughs> uh, I'll, make, I'll make a video review of me playing terrible games with this terrible accessory. <laughs> it'll, it'll just be a very late-breaking review of the Power Glove, which came out when, like, in 1980-what? <laughs> yep. Any, so, so on that note, any um 20-year-old peripherals that, you know, listeners and readers want to send in, we'll review those for you at no charge. Yeah, you just pay shipping and handling. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, you know, they got to pay money on top of that. So then after that, I went out and tracked down a Saturn. If I'm going to go retro, I might as well go for the obscure one that no one plays. Well, um, yeah, right. Well, as far as no one plays it, but it's, you know, it's it's very popular among those that have played it. A lot of people swear by the Saturn. Yeah, and so far, other than my terrible collection of sports games, just because that's what came with the system I bought off eBay, I've been able to find a couple of really fun games that aren't terribly expensive like Saturn games can get. Mm-hmm. So can we look forward to you covering, doing some Saturn coverage for us, perhaps, then? Yeah, I think for the retro feature, which I'm going to be starting, which should be up by the time you hear this, I think the first game I'm writing about is from the Saturn. It's called Galactic Attack. Mm-hmm. Which I've also been playing a little bit this week. Now, did you know that they're still um, making games for the Saturn? I read that, and <laughs> I want to 
I'll support the people who are doing that because so far I love the system. It's working really well for me so far. So um, I want to kind of go back to you mentioning Crisis Core um, because when you when you talked about it, I was trying to think. Um, there's also a there's a, a spinoff game um, on the PlayStation 2, but it's not a prequel. Um, it's it's like a I guess an unofficial sequel in some ways, but it's more like a shooter. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. I'm I'm desperately trying to think of the name of it. I think I've heard about it because I was looking up um, other games when I was deciding whether to buy Crisis Core or not. I, yeah. I think there's an entire series that just focuses around Seven. I I can't for the life of me. It's something that focuses on uh, Vincent Valentine. I, I remember that. I played like the first chapter of it or something along those lines like 10 years ago. Yeah, I think I actually when I was at GameStop picking this up, I found that, but that was like two dollars more, so I didn't grab it, unfortunately. I <laughs> I keep wanting to say um, the only thing that comes to mind right now for me is um, Advent Children, but that's the I uh, think that's the movie. Yeah, yeah, obviously that's the the, the movie. So I, I know I'm anyway. It, it's not not terribly important. I know it was a it was a game that didn't do well. It wasn't well received. It's I'm sure nobody listening to this probably even has any clue what we're talking about when we, when I say the sequel to Final Fantasy VII. Dirge of Cerberus? Yes. Oh, yes. That yes. that, that, that okay. would be it. Yeah, you know, how, how can I not remember that? It's so so obvious, so plain. Yeah. It's, I've, everyone's talking about it. I don't know where you are. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only place where they're not talking about it. Um, but so, to me, I've, I've always liked... Like, Final Fantasy VII is definitely among my, my top games. I'm sure somewhere we've published a list of uh, our you know top picks of this and that and I, I i always gravitate back to final fantasy 6 and 7 um so i'm and i don't own a psp so for me that's out of the question to be able to play um the hell is it called that you're playing again uh crisis core crisis core man with these subtitles are killing me why can't i just call it like Especially final fantasy because final fantasy 7 is the subtitle oh so it's actually crisis core final Fan- well whatever who cares right um, that's going to be. I probably will never get a chance to play, but I'm like, I'm, I'm just curious to know a little bit more about it. I think, um, if I remember right, Zach was uh, the, like the, uh, he played a part in the original game story as the, I don't know, the, the phantom boyfriend of Eris. Something like that. Yep. Like I said earlier, I haven't actually played the game, so to me, it's more just a Final Fantasy game that has cloud in it. So is it um RPG based? Um, does, does it follow? It's... It's really interesting. It's an action game. You're just running around. You have free roaming. And then when you go into battles, it sort of locks you down into a specified area with invisible walls keeping you to fight the same enemies. Mm. But then you don't really gain experience. right? Like up in the corner of the screen, you have basically a slot machine going constantly. And it has different characters' faces. And if it's just three slots, if the first and third one line up as a face... It stops everything and lets the third, the second one spin. And if they all match up, then you do a limit break. If the numbers match up, then you do certain things. Like if you get three sevens, you level up. If you get three ones, you're invincible for a time. It's really weird, <laughs> but it keeps like even the most normal battles from being from getting tiring. So are you saying that you don't actually get to input any commands uh, for the for combat? Um, you do. You're still fighting, but mm. you're not. It's basically it. All it boils down to is run behind the enemy, get behind him, just keep hitting A, and which will do critical attacks if you're behind him and he's frozen enough between each attack that you can just do that till you kill him. Okay, so it's, so it's like a so, bonus gauge, maybe then. Basically. Or additional attacks or something like that. But yeah. It also determines what you level up, how you level up when you do special attacks. Yeah, it you doesn't really sound familiar to me. Over. I don't. I don't think I've heard of this in any other Square Enix game. Um, this... I haven't heard of it ever. It's really yeah. kind of weird to get used to. That, that kind of bothers me a little bit. Um, the the constant changes to the the battle formula, even just in the in the main series like RPGs uh, for Final Fantasy. Not the not even counting the spinoffs. Um, I really like the the old school um, turn based battle system. And you know, which I guess every every game from uh, pretty much what from Final Fantasy, the original Final Fantasy, all the way up to um, nine. Uh, I think we could probably even 
count Final Fantasy X with that or Final Fantasy X. This is a, a very similar setup, but I I, I like that uh, the turn base and with all the um, with your party lined up on one side of the screen and the enemies neatly arranged on the opposite side of the screen and all that. Uh, yeah, I, it makes it a lot better. For yep. this, you so, don't have any additional players. It's just you the entire game. Oh, so it's not even a okay. Well, so it's really just going away from the the RPG formula. It sounds like basically, hmm. which I'm not really sure if I'm liking it that much so far it's interesting but it's not that great yeah that's not really i don't think that's worked out well with um with any other um final fantasy spinoff where they tried to just go into a completely different genre although i will say that um i'm disappointed that as it is right now i won't be able to play the 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 new spinoff that's coming up um I'm not sure if you've heard of this uh i haven't seen any news on it in a little while but it's been announced um, it's um, Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy. Ooh, yes. I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, so oh, so I'm a little bit jealous right now it, that you're definitely going to be playing it, and I don't think I'll ever get the chance to do it. So, yeah, that's the music one, right? Yeah. Yeah, and and just and because I, I really like the final... That's basically like uh, some of my most favorite... Uh, game soundtracks are from various Final Fantasy games. Um, so I would have probably really liked this game as being the only spin-off from the series that I think I would have enjoyed. And um, I, I believe it's coming out for the 3DS. So un- yep. un- unless I plan on purchasing that, which I don't, I guess I will get a chance to play that one. Yeah, it comes out in just over a month, and hopefully I'll be playing that. Maybe even reviewing it, I have no idea. Well, I hope for your sake, then, that you do get a chance to do that. So you are you playing anything current at the moment? Um, let me see. I'm playing a couple of Wii games. I um going through Metroid Other M, which I've only played a couple of Metroid games. I'm trying to work my way through and just play all of them because so far I've really liked what I've seen so far. Yeah. Uh, no, but, I, I kind of I'm going to interrupt you there because I thought um that's the one I haven't played, but from what I understand, Me- Other M is the shitty one. Yep. <laughs> So why are you picking that one to, to begin with then? I, I've played, um, I've played both of the um, the Metroid Prime Prime games. The entire trilogy, or because there's Metroid Prime, Echoes, and Corruption. Okay then, um, no then I, I I gotta correct myself then. Um, I've only I have I've played the first two, which is just Metroid Prime and then Echoes. Yeah, I've only played Prime, and then I've played um, a few of the handheld ones but then i found other m for literally ten dollars so that's why i decided well this is a terrible game but it only costs ten dollars and it's metroid compared to the other ones what makes that one so bad um the voice acting the voice acting is terrible basically what um team ninja did is they decided that if we're gonna fill in sam's entire backstory we're gonna have her explain every little thing as she goes along. And right at the beginning, when she's flying your ship to wherever she's going, she, like, um, a signal pops up, and she said, oh, that's the baby's cry. It's called that because it simulates a baby crying, which means there's someone in distress. Mm. Like, when a baby cries, you have to, it just goes on and on. And it's absolutely terrible, and the voice actors are, they don't really know what they're doing. Um, yeah, because I don't, so I I don't think, see... I don't seem to remember the the previous two games um, having uh, really any voice acting to speak of. No, I think that I'm pretty sure this is the first time Samus has ever had a voice. Yeah. And it would have been better if they had just gone with Zelda, where everyone else talks and she doesn't. Are you are you talking about um, Skyward just, Sword? Like, have the, or just have the silent protagonist stay a little bit, or yeah. at least just cut down the volume of text which was really unnecessary and i'm not sure why they did that um does other m still have the exploration aspect to it um that that prime and echoes did where you know you scan a lot of items in the environment you get to read to your heart's content about the the makeup of the geography and all that stuff unfortunately not because that was one of my favorite parts of those games i love that no I mean, um what you you're holding for most of the games just in a 2d perspective like two and a half D or whatever you want to call it. And you're just holding the Wii 
NES style, just controlling it like any other 2D game. Mm -hmm. But then if you point the Wii Remote at the screen, then it goes into first-person mode like in Metroid Prime. That's how you shoot missiles and can kind of scan things, but it's only to find the important things you need to move on to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Um, that that really... um... I mean, I was like enraptured with that in the in the previous games. I I, I tried to scan everything I could, and I, I literally sat there for hours and hours, you know, of total time just reading what what's what amounts basically to useless text, you know, just flavored text for the for the world. But I I really appreciated that, and it's the only reason why I bothered playing through both of those games. Yeah, because especially right at the end of the first one, it gets really they tried really hard to pad the game, but it worked out okay. Yeah, and then you, you having to go around and find all the runes and everything. Sure, and I, th- I think it was in um in Echoes where you're that's probably what you're referring to, where you have to uh, where you're uncovering like the relics of a an ancient civilization and, and and doing all that. Um, yeah. As you're going through the ruins of of whatever came after, um. And and I gotta I gotta admit by the way, you know, kind of taking this even more retro. I think I've played, up until that point at least, up until uh, Metroid Prime Echoes, I've played every uh, Metroid game, um, and I have yet to beat the original Metroid. I don't know how many times I've started and tried, um, and I don't know if you've played it, but I find myself not... I've tried to. Yeah. For some reason, I have it on Game Boy Advance. I have no idea why. I found it the other day. I apparently own it. But I haven't been able to put that much time into it. I think one of these days I just need to sit down, have the maps printed out in front of me, and just go through it. Oh, so you're going to go online and look up look up the maps? Either do that or just have a bunch of graph paper and do it the old school way. Well, I've tried it that way myself as well, and as I was still not successful. I mean, in that, that game has so many um, hidden passages that... The, there, I'm assuming that the Game Boy Advance version is identical to the NES version, then, um, but th- they're just impossible to know that they're there. Basically, the only way you'll know it is if you happen to lay a bomb next to it, and uh, when it blows up, it blows up like the uh, a brick that reveals a secret passage. But if you don't do that, you just you won't be able to find it. And I, you know, I spent, I don't know, I mean, the last time I really tried was probably over 10 years ago, but I would spend hours just turning into a, um, I, I, I guess, a, I guess it's called a, the morph ball and just and rolling around and just laying um, a ton of bombs everywhere I go and, and, and getting nowhere with it, really. Uh, it's so, fr- I mean, I, I love um, Super Metroid um, and they definitely, and I think the map system was a big reason why it was so, so beatable. Um, I had yeah. no no problem with it. I wish I could. Uh, they, uh, they had implemented that with the original, but even my own map making map, map making uh, didn't help me get through that one. Yeah, that's why they eventually went back for Game Boy Advance and just remade it as Zero Mission, which was basically the close to the same game, except actually slightly less difficult. Yeah, I I can see that. Uh, I would probably need that in myself. I'm, I'm, I like, and I've, I've played a lot of the Nintendo games, but I've found that I've, I've only beaten like a tiny fraction of them, and Metroid is definitely not one of them. I, you know, I've not even um, completed the original like Super Mario Brothers. Uh, I'm ashamed Neither to say. Neither have I actually. I <laughs> actually tried. I pulled that up the other day, and then I can get to World Eight, and then I die, and <laughs> I die, and then I give up. Why is it so hard? I don't know. I've beaten the third one. That took me a month. And I just had my NES clone thing on for a month straight, and I would just keep going back to it every couple of days and beating a level or two. And then You mean you didn't turn it off in between, like at night or anything? No, because if you turn it off, it resets the cartridge. Oh you have to level on one screen, one stage one. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and, well, I mean, I, I can't say anything. I Neither have I. To be, <laughs> not even... Um, I'm trying to remember if I've beaten the second one. I don't think I have. I don't. I've not beaten any of the um, original Nintendo Mario games. I haven't actually played the second one at all. I own it. It's in a box on my desk, but I just haven't. I don't want to try it just yet. It's uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to beat it at this point without just putting in 
time wise. Of I have enough other games that I'm already sinking hours into that Mario can wait a bit longer. Um, I've, you know, the other day um, at B&B, uh, Jeff was actually the one talking about this. Um, you had sent out um, an email and you've you've kind of pointed some of us into the direction of um, this website that I don't I, I don't know if it's fair to say you found it, but um, you, you certainly found it, you know, as far as I'm concerned, which is um, Ba the backloggery is that correct dot com yeah or just backloggery maybe dot com I um, think it's backloggery dot com and I don't know how many other of those staff members took you up on that but I I did go and check out the site I made an account and I've and I've started to um, catalog uh, my my backlog of games I've so far I've gotten through um, like my uh, Super NES and NES games and uh, most of my PC games I haven't I haven't gotten any further than that um, but I, that's that's what I'm saying. I, I found that a lot of my old school NES titles, I've I played. I uh, couldn't get anywhere with them. I didn't beat them. Most of them, I probably only got through a few levels. And I'm just not, I guess, a good enough gamer. Like those games take, uh, I, I I guess they just take such dedication that you would have to just uh, play it to the exclusion of everything else. And I can't. And I never did. Yeah, because back then they were still going off the arcade idea where this game is going to be so hard that you will just keep pumping quarters in until you either run out of money or you win. <laughs> for for some of them, um, for some of those games... Or you just give up. Yeah, for, I, I can see that for some of them. And the other ones are just... I don't know if it's just controls uh, that were made easier since then or more accessible or we have better options. I'm, I, I just don't know, but um, it's it's not always that, like, I'm I'm being killed by the enemies on the screen. You know, sometimes it's just I can't master the game because I can't bring my character to successfully maneuver through it. You know, I just, I, I I can't even like uh, I just can't navigate the game. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think it's, it comes down. Yeah, that's why. To that case. That's why games like um, the old Mega Man, not counting the original, because that one was they didn't know how to make a game fair at that point. <laughs> But by the time the second and third one came around, that game just has so the controls are just so tight that that is a game that if you put enough time into it, you'll be able to beat it eventually, and you'll get a feeling this is fair. I've actually accomplished something. So there's some <laughs> other games that are just like I don't know how I won, but I won. Time to move on. Sure, I I do remember Mega Man Two was one of the 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 first it was the first Mega Man game I I ever beat and was one of the first probably NES games period that I beat and I mean this is back in uh, again I'm not sure what gear it came out but I think I'm pretty sure it was in the late 80s uh, like uh, between 88 to 90 sometime what I'm talking about uh, when I played it and I I beat Mega Man 2 and I I beat it like over and over again just so many times like you know you just kind of figure out the pattern and um in in which to kill the bosses and just had a blast with it. And then, then came the day that I uh, I went and rented uh, Mega Man 3 from a local uh, rental store, took it home, um, and I was playing it on a different controller as well. Which this this will this whole story will go to show you what what like how ignorant of gaming I was at the time. So um, I I forget why, but I. I had a different controller that I was playing on for whatever reason, and it turned out that it was a, a turbo controller, where you can just turn on the like turbo jumping or turbo fire or whatever. Um, yeah. Unfortunately for me, I I didn't like understand the concept of that. I didn't know what the hell it was, um, and I wouldn't have known how to use it. So the um, when I started playing Mega Man Three, the turbo function, the jump button was set to turbo, uh, and what that translated to in the game is basically Mega Man would continuously jump but he wouldn't make like full jumps um he would make little tiny hops and just continue to do them um so you could shoot you could move left and right but it was in a, a jumping motion if that you know or, or a little hopping motion um, it basically made it impossible to play yeah and now i didn't know the controller was doing this like i said <laughs> i didn't even know i had no clue uh what a turbo controller was at the time i think it was like eight or nine years old and I was the only gamer that I knew, so nobody was around to like tell me this. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, so you just basically assumed that the game was broken. I, well, I thought this was the oh. game. This was the way the game was made to be played. Like, I, you know, it's a, a new Mega Man game. It's 
the next sequel up in the uh, in the franchise. So I just figured, you know, this was one of the new design decisions. And and every level I went into, no matter which like Robot Master I tried to take on, that's what I was getting. And you know, I some of the levels I did make it to the boss. I don't know if I beat any of them, but now nah, anyway, you definitely can't play it. And just left me with like a horrible taste in my mouth of Mega Man at that moment. You know, Mega Man 2 built me up for success and then due to ignorance on my part, really, just uh, Mega Man 3 is the one that uh, killed it for me. I know it had, like, um, had bosses like, I think, Snake Man and stuff like that, and I just ended up hating that game. After two or three days of it, I just hated it. Like, it's the future of gaming. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I probably almost stopped playing games altogether that would have been the end of it for me back then in like 1989 but so yeah um and on that note i also have not beaten mega man one and i've tried <laughs> i just I've, I think... I've beaten it if you count playing it on a computer but i don't think that counts um i don't know i guess i guess probably like in the true sense of the word no it wouldn't no one of these days i want to the only one i actually own is three and then I have um, the Zero games on when they were re-released in the DS cart. And I haven't actually... I've beaten all the Zero games on Easy, which is basically... It just takes all of them, smashes them into one continuous thing, gives you all the power-ups and everything, and you can basically just blow through it without really dying. So and then, do you not get any choice in like which, which order to take on the, uh, the bosses then? Well, in that game, it's, they're, they're mission-based. So you get, you choose four, it's out of four, you play through all of them, you get a boss, there's another four, there's another boss, mm. and then you beat all eight again, and then you fight the real boss. Okay. It's basically how it works. And then I've, I own Mega Man 3 somewhere around here, and I made it to whatever, towards the end, once you beat all the eight robot masters, it brings in, you basically have to beat all the Royal Masters for Mega Man 2 as well. Oh, wow. How about that? And then all the ones from 3 again. And okay. then Dr. Wily. So. It's kind of random. Um, unless they fixed it, I, I think they might have changed it, but I seem to remember Mega Man 2, the, uh, the secret was to take out, um, I think it was Air Man first, and then, yep. what's the guy? I think his name was Metal Man, uh, because... His weapon, I think if you use it against him, like his own weapon will kill him in two hits. Some kind, Pretty like much, because it's, it, it, it's the only one that can fire in all eight directions, which is very helpful. Well, well that's... Um, he, okay, either I'm remembering that differently, or they changed it for the, for the release you're talking... I thought it was just a single shot, like a saw blade, basically. It is, but you can... You just... You can keep shooting it, but you can shoot it in diagonals as well. Oh, I thought I thought you were saying at the same time in eight directions, like a, a multi-shot or oh, something. Oh, that would have been very helpful. <laughs> helpful or, yeah, well, you know, some people would call that cheating or too easy. Cheating, right? yep. Well, um, hmm. This is, we've really been, you know, focusing on retro here today. It wasn't really, I guess it wasn't the ultimate intention, but that's kind of what came about. Um now, I will tell you that um, I apparently haven't become any better at gaming since those days because I'm just actually just uh, like uh, an hour ago, basically right before we um, we started recording this podcast, I was still playing uh, Max Payne 3 um, and I, I, I reviewed it recently and I... Um, I finished the story mode and you know played the uh, multiplayer for a bit before doing the review. So I've just been going back now and um, heading into the multiplayer. And on the easy, the easy matches, basically the ones made for low-level players, I'm able to. Actually, I got a. At, at one point today, I did finish a match in first place, and then when I headed on to the the harder difficulties, the the actual meat of the multiplayer, um, solidly, solidly in last place every time. Like out of a, out of two teams with you know ten players each, easily last place in the game. So yeah, um, apparently my my reflexes are not what they need to be. I never have been. I'm or sure they're just the hordes of people who focus on one game and become crazily good at it, and then just stay on multiplayer for years. 
Yeah, I mean they are, but Max Payne has just come out, so I was hoping maybe that wouldn't yeah. be the case yet. But ultimately, it's the same skill set that they probably already cultivated in uh, Battlefield and Call of Duty and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, and and Halo, and and I'm just not made for that. I try, I try my best. So, um, if you see my gamer tag out there, take it easy. <laughs> Give me a free kill, maybe if you like. So I read the review and I'm interested in the game, but I haven't played any of the. I haven't played the first two. Would I be able to just jump into this one? Yeah, I think and it's really understand it or. I think so because it's it's a completely um, separate story. It um it's it's set several years after the previous games um and in the narrative touches on the events that happen in um in parts one and two but only in so far as basically all you really need to um to know is um that if even if i just said max Payne has went through um you know per- a lot of personal tragedy and uh family tragedy that that would set up everything you would need to be able to play this game because he's yeah. um what i really loved about that game as far as like uh, narrative wise, is that like right from the basically the title screen, the the opening menu before you even start the game, um, it it kind of opens up on a a, a cinematic cutscene and it's it's just him, um, it's Max in his like apartment, um, popping pills and and drinking heavily, like bottle after bottle and stumbling around, passing out. Um, it's awful, you know. Like I've never seen um, a video game character where I've just felt, man, like this guy is like if um, scraping the bottom of the barrel would be a step up for him. You know, he's like yeah. as low as you can possibly go and like hanging on by a thread. I don't know why you would even, uh, can you know, continue to <laughs> lead your life basically in, in in that state. So um, and 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 it goes from there. Uh, so as long as you know that some really bad shit has happened to him, I think it, it sets it up um, plenty with that knowledge. And then and the rest of the game is, is a separate narrative. And it, the setting changes from the previous game, so there's not really much that you need to know outside of that. All right, so I might check that out after I um, try to get through my frightening backlog of games. Yeah, I I got, you know, it's it's one of the... Um, the most impressed I've been with a with a game in a while. Uh, multiplayer is fun too. Um, I think I'm just I'm just more made for a single player because I I just can't keep up with um, the amount of uh, reflexes and the amount of like experience that the other players bring to the table. I I just don't have that to offer. So I like I said I end up in last place. Um, Story wise, it was great. Um, and it's it's a good thing for me personally that you're not required to really have a deep knowledge of the other games. Um, I've played each game in the series, but man, those were the last one was um, I think it came out in 2003, so nine years ago. You asking me to remember anything that happened in a game that came out like a year ago is too much for me, unless I research it first. There's no way I'm going to be able to remember um, intricate story details from Max Payne 2 from nine years ago. So um, luckily, that not needed. <laughs> Outside of Max Payne Three, I've I haven't really like even played a ton of games this week, um, or in the recent past, like not at least not a ton of uh, very noteworthy games. Um, I'm uh, I'm I'm getting through, and actually I probably will get back to this after we do the podcast. Um, I'm getting through a, a point and click game on the PC. Uh, I've played about maybe five hours of it so far it's called gray matter um and it's that's another that's i guess a a guilty pleasure of mine the um pc based point and click adventures um which i think i well so i got into those like (laughs) during the mid 90s and look like i'm i'm very um pleased to see that they're making somewhat of a comeback lately uh, that's that's my my planned gaming for the rest of today, and I probably will take up a good chunk of my my week next week. I don't want to, I don't want it to get to the point where that's all I'm playing for like three weeks straight is just Max Payne three and Gray Matter, and then the next week Max Payne three and Gray Matter. But that's kind of what's what's on my plate. Um, that is outside of um, paying attention to E3, of course. So um, maybe uh, as a as a closing topic. Um, Let's let's discuss a little bit about E3. By the time that um, 
we published a podcast, um, which we're aiming for Wednesday right now. E3 will be, you know, halfway to most of the way over. Uh, most of the really uh, noteworthy stuff will likely have been announced already. Um, so we're not really giving any predictions, but there's one thing that we've we've um, covered in our last Friday roundtable on B&B Gaming, which is um, Jeff. I don't I don't know if you had a, a chance to weigh in on that one. Um, I know I I did. Um, and it was kind of a topic I want to get your spin on. Uh, it was um, all about whether E3 uh, as a conference altogether has has lost its luster, basically. Has it lost its relevance or does it have life left? I don't know. Uh, what do you think? I think um, just focusing on the three main companies, at least for Microsoft and Sony, I think it has just because for all the big games, we already know they exist. We know Halo 4 is, exists, Assassin's Creed 3, GTA 5. We know these games are out there, and we're just waiting for the trailers to show up. So in that sense, I don't think it's as relevant, just because it's basically just a central point to draw more attention to it, although it could um, happen in other ways, just throughout other media. I mean, something like Grand Theft Auto V, I could have told you 10 years ago that that game was coming, too, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, and there will be a sixth one, eventually. <laughs> um, I think that's pretty a pretty safe bet there. Um, but I know, and we've discussed this to death, you know, on the website, so I don't know, I'm, I'm not keen on rehashing all of it either. That was and pretty much the consensus of um, those of us on the Friday Roundtable this past week was that Pretty much as you said, the show is is it's focusing on on the wrong things. It's not really giving us anything that we we don't already know and that we we couldn't take a you know a good guess at. Um, I know what I'd personally like to see a lot more of. I know there's you know it's just not financially feasible, so it isn't going to happen. But what would actually excite me is if if we got coverage of smaller games or um, or at least like. I don't know if you want to call it side projects, you know, lesser known games from um, well-known developers that aren't going to get the kind of release and um, like an advertising spotlight that the big ones will get. That's the kind of stuff I would really like to, so that I'm actually learning about games uh, during the E3 conference, not just uh, getting a release date on a game that I've already been hearing about for, you know, a year and a half now. Mm. Or a short trailer that says, hey, this game exists, wait till next year and we might tell you some more about it. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think it was, uh, I think it was Declan, he, he, said, he said it pretty well when he said, um, some developers have started to release teaser trailers for their E3 previews. You know, so they're teasing um, a bit of news that they're going to give another preview for at E3. Um, yep. It's, at, at, at what point... Does it just be, you know, does it just become like, I mean, I can, how about I'm releasing, uh, re releasing a teaser this year for a game that's coming out in, you know, 2028 or whatever. <laughs> we had, you know, we've had an idea for a game. Here's a teaser trailer for it. I don't know. Um, and then the other, the other part of that is that really a lot of news is being either leaked or uh, deliberately put out there ahead of E3. Um, so that takes away even more relevance from the actual event itself. I mean, it's, it's really just a date on the calendar that the companies have to have news out by now, you know, if they don't want to fall behind it, their competitors. Um, so what's to keep them from, from doing it outside of the E3 confines? And I think more and more of them are, are picking up on that. And like um, Konami had a uh, an actual named pre-E3 conference the other day. Um, so it's pretty safe to say that you know they're not going to be uh, probably having a big spotlight I guess at E3 with this uh, the same information again it, as it would be very like really redundant on their part um, that said a lot of the stuff at Konami's um, pre-E3 conference I'm personally pretty excited about um, I don't know if you've had a chance to see some of this yet uh, it they we do have um, links to the trailers on the website uh, but one of the ones that I'm so far, like one of the only games that I'm, I'm really looking to find out more about and kind of excited about is Lords of Shadow 2. 
uh, the Castlevania sequel. Maybe maybe this will convince you to buy a 3DS and then you play Theaterism too. Um, maybe. I mean, if there's plenty of software out there that will probably get me to do it, I got to tell you, I've um, the only current gen console I don't own is a Wii, and I haven't outside of like we said earlier the the metroid games outside of that i've really never seen a reason to get one um and i still don't even now i don't know i'm not like a smash brothers fanatic um i'm not a mario kart guy i'm not a mario party guy I'm, that pretty much rules out most most games for the console right there i think um what am i missing out on i mean other than like maybe sunshine mario uh, I think that's- uh mario sunshine was gamecube but i actually just got a Wii myself recently, oh. and I've just been playing some of the smaller games that basically get looked over. Sorry, but, I, what, I mean, what I meant to say was uh, Mario Galaxy. Galaxy, right. yeah. I haven't played those either myself, but maybe eventually. Um, well, I, I know that uh, the original Lords of Shadow um, I loved. I played it on the um, the Xbox. I played it way after its release. You know, I just picked it up at the store because uh, I I saw it was cheap. It was actually um, <laughs> they had uh, two copies <laughs> when I went to the store. They had the um, just the basic game release um, as a used title, um, and then they had the collector's edition, brand new. And for whatever reason, the new collector's edition was actually cheaper than the used basic game. Um, and you know, I even asked the guy at the counter, like, um, yeah, it, it, just make sure if the the price sticker was correct or if maybe they had forgotten to relabel it. So, uh, but no, I was right. So I picked up the um, collector's edition, which included like the soundtrack and stuff like that, which it has a really good soundtrack um, on top of that. Um, and I just loved it. I mean, it was it was literally one of the first games on the 360 where. Um, where my jaw just hit the floor in certain in certain moments, it was it was pretty epic. I know it's a, kind of a far cry from the original Castlevania formula, um, but in its own right, as a kind of like a you know comparable to things like God of War, you know the same play style, um, the same over the top type of enemies and things like that. Uh, but it was it was excellent gaming to be had, if, in my opinion. And uh, we we hosted a video review at the time. I don't. It's not up anymore. It's um, it's been removed already. One of the the previous writers for the website, Scott Carmichael, he he had done a um, a video review just absolutely slamming the game, um, and obviously uh, for for various reasons, including that it didn't seem very accurate. That's been removed. So, uh, but my opinion, two thumbs up. So I'm looking forward to that. So that was like at Konami's. Um, uh, press conference and then the other I guess the big one the other big one would be the new Metal Gear Solid title which is um, you know sen- sensibly named Revengeance I mean Revengeance yeah <laughs> um, I kind of I, I really did like a triple take on that you know before I before writing it down I was like I, I really thought somebody had made a, a big mistake in um in publishing that title, like, whoa, whoa, you, didn't you mean to change the spelling on that word? But no, um, I researched it, and that's that's it. So, and um, I don't know if you've seen the trailer for it. Uh, it doesn't, to me, look anything at all like Metal Gear Solid. I actually haven't, and I'm trying. I own most. I own the first three, but I haven't actually played any of them, so I need to do that. Oh uh, well, you might get a, a chance because they, you know they're also re-releasing. Um, uh, I think most of the first, they're releasing uh, the H- the HD collection, which I think is Metal Gear Solid two and three, so you can pick it up that way if you wanted to. Yeah, find Twin Snakes, which gets rid of the terrible PlayStation controls, and then maybe get the HD collection. Just buy them again. Might as well. I mean, I, the terrible controls are kind of part of it um, at this point. I don't know if I could go back and play and replay Resident Evil with better controls and and still feel like it's the same game. Like, I kind of think that in some some of these cases, the old controls are part of what I would want to have back with it. I don't know. And and maybe I would eat my words if I actually tried it out. I, that's very possible. But but so the new one, like I said, it's um it's been trailered already. Um, maybe they'll show it again at the actual E3. Um, to me, it really looks a lot more like Ninja Gaiden than it does anything 
having to do with Metal Gear Solid. Um, Snake's not in it. It's apparently featuring featuring Raiden, um, which you said you haven't played him. I don't know how much you know about them, but he's a character from Metal Gear Solid 2. Um, that didn't go over very well with <laughs> with fans. So the the gameplay looks like I said, Ninja Gaiden. It's it's ninja oriented, like jumping, you know, uh, from a rooftop into the sky and slashing at a helicopter with your um, with 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 your katana and all kinds of nonsense Perfect. like that. Well, non it seems kind of nonsensical to me for a Metal Gear title though. What happened to hiding in a box? Yeah, it's um, I want some of that. Where's that? So, in, and I own um, all of the Metal Gear Solid titles. I've not played the fourth one, um, mostly because I bought it for PlayStation 3, and I never play my PlayStation 3 ever. Um, and uh, I don't know why that is, but that's the reason why I haven't played the fourth one yet. And I think I'm a little bit afraid to, to go into it and play Old Man Snake. Um, I, I liked my Snake the way he was previously. And so that I know that sounds like it has multiple meanings. Um, and maybe it does. And I, I was gonna say maybe it does too. Uh, but so all in all, it was a lot of good information. And, and there were other titles mentioned as well: Zone of the Enders HD Collection, um, and a remake of Frogger, <laughs> which fits in very well with all the above, I think somehow. Um, yeah, but that's the the Konami thing. So, um, any other words on E3 in general and, and anything that has to do with E3? Um, to go back to the original topic of whether it's still relevant, I think the one company, I think it's still relevant for Nintendo, mostly because Nintendo doesn't ever say anything about, they mostly just keep, except for the third parties who they allow, like Konami released um, Lodge Shadow 2, mm. which is coming out for the 3DS. But for most of their main games, we have no idea. Like, we know the Wii U is going to be released, and we know Pikmin 3 is most likely going to be there. Mm -hmm. But other than that, they haven't told us anything, so we have no idea what's coming. But, I mean, do, do you like, do you think that's the right way to do it? Um, I think for... I know I appreciate it for Nintendo, just because I like seeing the way they... Um, show off their new games, but maybe maybe it's time for them to move on to just telling people when everyone else is. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll see after this E3 if it still works compared to the other um, company strategies. Well, where do we really have to go from here? If 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 we do look at like a change, you know, and if in the next who knows a couple of years um, there's a big turnaround and the system just kind of the E3 system just decomposes, basically. Uh, are we are we just going to go to everybody having their own individual press releases? Because um, in that case, w why wait till the first week of June? You know, why not do it whenever you feel like it? Uh, you you know, you can do it in mid December or um, at the beginning of April or who knows when. Um, so not not to really have a centralized time or um, event anymore at all. That could be interesting. I know um, Tokyo Game Show. Well, that's it's only Japanese games, obviously. But that's sort of the same thing because it has the main thing. But then all the other companies, or a lot of them, have their own individual conferences ahead of time. So it's sort of like that. But but think also of the cost involved in starting up a conference like that. And if you want any kind of coverage. Um, you know, in, in on, from websites and magazines, you know, in, in the, the press has to be invited. Um, I, I can imagine a lot of the uh, quote-unquote smaller um, developers and publishers and such, they need this kind of like exposure. They, you know, they 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 would need a a three-day um, convention center event like E3 or uh, or what have you to be able to get their games like seen and played by the public and 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 by the media more importantly. Um, yeah. And if we go away from that, you know, it, because the the big guys and the medium guys, you know, what are they gaining from waiting until E3? Um, I think the only thing that they're basically uh, what they're doing is they're agreeing to share the spotlight with everybody else. You know, but why do that? Why not do it a week early or a month early or whatever? Um and have all the attention focused on you. If you can afford to do it, why not? But then that kind of takes away 
like I said, the meaning of the whole event, eventually the importance of it, and the smaller guys will will lose that venue uh, of of being able to put their stuff out there. This is uh, this is what I, what I think. Um, yeah, that's a good point because the smaller third parties are definitely important to keeping the big three going, especially through the drought years that they all have every once in a while. Yeah, which is um, for some of them is what now and all the time. Yeah, especially so, for Nintendo, most of the time, third actually, party is definitely important. Yeah, I really wish that um, the the focus on, on 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 just trying to have you know your news be be the one that gets noticed ahead of time or or to stand out like it would be nice if we can step away from that um, and if we can just do it like a it, it can go back to being a centralized event i mean there's there's a reason why it started out that way and 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 why it gained you know fame and um, attention that way um, and it seems to be just it's it's being kind of like um destroyed and divided up from within the the, the industry itself is kind of doing that i think but um but yeah, I, I'm gonna be. I think, I think at some point, pretty soon, even now, I think we're all pretty, pretty good and tired of like chewing over E3 and what it's doing right and wrong. And we have a whole another week to like look forward to it, and then probably another week or two and three of wrap ups. And uh, yeah, it can't end fast enough. And then the games actually start coming out, which is the important part. <laughs> yeah. So if we get to, like, wow, are we, are we even supposed to be like? playing games and paying attention to them at all <laughs> or just looking forward to them or uh, anticipating them so yeah uh pretty sure i'm pretty sure that um it'll be a week or two or three before we um are even able to distance ourselves enough from e3 to sit down and record a whole nother podcast which isn't centered on e3 um and in the meantime we'll have plenty of coverage for that like it or not <laughs> positive or negative We've got a lot of new writers lately, uh, and many of them have not yet made it onto one of our podcasts, hopefully in the near future. But uh, yeah, if you've made it this far in the podcast, um, thanks for joining us, and check us out on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Raptor, those of, uh, of you who are signed up for that, and if you haven't signed up for it yet, um, but you're like me and you like sharing and cataloging and looking at your game statistics that's actually a pretty useful site as well for that <laughs> and there's bnb gaming news on there as well uh so you can check us out on that site all right and uh with that said let me uh let me thank jeff truen for joining me today yeah it was great hopefully i'll be able to be on some more of these in the future i'm, I'm sure you will you maybe you can have the hosting hosting gig next time around oh, oh dear you know be careful what you ask for um, all right. In the meantime, uh, thanks to the rest of you for joining us. This is Pascal, and um, have a have a good day. Bye.